hello everyone welcome back to the channel so i am recording this video for the third time first time i something happened with the screen recorder before i could save the video and second time i just forgot to set the right mic and here i am third time recording the same video but now everything is, is at its right place so let's just begin lecture now so <coughs> we're gonna be studying classical macroeconomic model of output and employment today but before getting into the technicalities and details of model i would like you people to have a little bit of intuitive idea how we got into classical where from where did this term classical come all right, all these details so classical as, as you can see is simply an english word and classical is something from where other things got evolved right for example we have classical music classical dances and we know that modern music and dances evolved from those classicals in the same manner we have classical economics because classical economics is the foundation of economics and the modern economics be it keynesians monetarism neo keynesian neo classical they got evolved from the classical economics okay all right and the classical system was as written in this slide all the economic work prior to 1936 is considered as classical economics and who said so Keynes came up with his paper in the year 1936 the general theory of employment interest and money and here he said the the term classical was coined by Karl Marx but Keynes gave it a much more important and greater role so the prominent so the term was brought into prominence by Keynes so Keynes in his paper stated that entire economics work before the year 1936 is the work of classicals right and he also coined the term macroeconomics and what is classical economics as such to understand classical economics we have to go, understand a bit about about what was prior to classical economics i mean of course there was there has to be some system before classical started its work right so before classical economics and idea we had a system called mercantilism now it's just an english term with a fancy name is it has nothing confusing here mercantile capitalism or mercantilism is basically a belief and it originated in england and as per this it is a belief that wealth and power of a nation is determined by its stock of precious metals in other words more bullion gems and jewelry gold reserve a nation has more powerful wealthy the nation is and the trade was considered a zero sum game it means that if there are two party trading one has to get the benefit for one has to get the benefit and other has to lose there cannot be a win win situation for both the player okay this is what zero sum game is but of course we know that trade is not a zero sum game there are parties involved and everybody get benefited by a mutual trading right but we're talking about the 17th 18th century here and the back then it was the idea that all right there is a bullionism thing and there is trade is a zero sum game so to extract maximum benefit state has to intervene and here comes the second tenet of, of mercantilism and that is it is a need for state action to direct development of the capitalist system so so as to keep the nozzle of trade towards our people benefit we need active state intervention and this is what mercantilism in and this is what great britain did back then we know that british britain intervened actively rigorously wherever their people went be it in india be it in northern america southern america africa so this is what mercantile capitalism is as a critique to this system there came the concept of classical economics I'm so sorry, guys. I I did make a slide on this, but I think it somehow got deleted. Also, I would like to clarify one thing here that you people don't really need to fret about slide thing here because we cannot encapsulate the essence of what this economics is into these tiny slides. Still, I would like I really will try to incorporate as many important points as I can in these slides. But if something got left out, I'll let you know. and either way even if i don't say anything you have to read the books on your own okay because because we are not going for a multiple choice questions format right paper is not going to be mcq type it's going to be quite tricky so yeah basic line we need to read the book that's it 
so we were, we're gonna be talking about classical economics here so mercantile system we talked about the active state intervention classical system no state intervention that let market forces work freely if you allow them to work freely all people are gonna work for their benefits they are gonna be operation of an invisible hand in the economy and that invisible hand gonna set everything at its rightful place we don't need state to intervene at all and Adam Smith stated so in his paper and it's called wealth of nation in the year 1776 okay so we got two system here mercantilism and capitalism sorry classical I'm so sorry if I keep on saying capitalism in place of classical basically the idea is saying a classical talk about capitalist system where there is a free interplay of market forces that's really Lesage's view there is not much of a difference still I, I will try to be specific okay so now the point is capitalist system or classical system came into being in the year 1776 with the Adam Smith's paper wealth of nation then how come we got the same system into operation for almost 100 plus years because we know that Keynesian economics came into being after publication of Keynes paper in the 1936 now, the reason being before tell you the reason I think this quote by Paul Samuelson really explains the situation well the quote is science is a parasite and the greater the patient population the better the advance in physiology and pathology and out of pathology arise therapy the year 1932 was the trough of the Great Depression and from its rotten soil we got a new subject called macroeconomics. So the crux of this statement is, up till 1930s we didn't face any turbulence at all. Things were working pretty fine, it was all smooth, it was full employment, all the tenets of classical economists were working really well. But the moment a turbulent phase set in, classical economists failed us. We experienced the Great Depression in 1930s because of steep fall in aggregate demand. And there is this consensus amongst all the economists behind the cause of the Great Depression of 1930s that yes, indeed, there was a steep fall in aggregate demand and that was the cause. But later on we'll study that classical economists, they do not acknowledge there being any issue about aggregate demand at all. Classical only talk about supply side economics. Even equilibrium employment level, equilibrium output level, everything is supply determined. If we're going to talk about it into much detail, I'm sure, I mean, this is what Freud has explained and this is what actual model is, but still I wanted you to have a little bit of intuitive idea how we got into the classical and to the Keynesians. What we, what we have learned up till now, I hope that you people have got the idea. Let's just move on to the second slide. Again, it's quite simple. I've explained with this, this thing already. Let me read it once again. So there have been two main intellectual traditions in macroeconomics, classical and Keynes, and the central theme in both the school of thought revolves around the concept of market versus state. So this concept of market versus state is quite important, and we know that classicals are all about free interplay of market forces, and Keynesians are about a regulated way of market, and state has to intervene so as to promote the welfare of weaker sections of the population because if we let market forces to work freely they're gonna be capitalist system and it's gonna get it's gonna give benefit to only people who are already empowered. And at present times we do know that we have a mix of both and government does intervene as and when things go out of control. But of course otherwise it let the market forces work free. Anyways now we are on to the most important part of our video today and that is assumptions of the classical model this is extremely important guys you have to memorize this assumption by heart and these should be at tips of your finger because this is where from where we're gonna set into the real economics and in exam we don't have much time we barely get six to seven minutes to write an answer so yeah long story short memorize these assumptions quickly and here itself the first line is, the classical economists did not formulate any specific theory of employment as such, they only laid down certain postulates. What does this mean? It means that the theory that we learn so elaborately in such a detailed manner, the classical economists as such didn't give this theory. They, they gave us certain statements, certain postulates and economists worked on those postulates and came up with the concept or an elaborate version of their employment theory. This is not 
so much important but because i really found it quite intriguing that the elaborate theory that we're studying so deeply it wasn't given by classical economists per se but rather it was developed much later anyways moving on to the assumptions now so as such these assumptions are self explanatory but again there's no point in me reading these english sentences directly so i will try to explain a bit as and where it become it, it is feasible for instance we are on to the assumption number 1 it says there is a state of full employment without inflation now this statement is extremely important when talking about classical economics what does it mean it simply means that we have full employment i mean at present we grapple with this problem of controlling in unemployment situation and that too without inflation we have to maintain a moderate level of inflation but it's such a, uh, okay it's such a diversity that classical economists assumed this thing automatically okay so now without criticizing much i should probably be sticking to the assumptions only so okay state of full employment simply means people who are seeking work they are getting work the choice is always between working at factory a or at factory b there is no such thing as remaining unemployment there is no such thing as working or not working so in classical economic economics we don't don't have a term called unemployment there is always a state of full employment and that too without inflation even if you are if even if we somehow happen to have into the stage of unemployment there going to be something happening in the market that we will be back to equilibrium level of unemployment we'll get back to this thing in a few seconds but right now we have to memorize that all right there is state of full employment always and that too without inflation okay coming to second assumption it says that there is a perfect competition in the product and labor market this statement is again so self explanatory and i don't know what else to add here still if i if i try then perfect competition is something where the buyer and seller has perfect information about the market conditions they know what is the cost what is the price so that nobody can cheat each other there are large number of sellers and buyers there is no monopoly or monopolistic competition product market is again where goods are sold and labor market is where the workers render their services and in turn gets paid in terms of wages right moving on to third assumption and that is supply always creates its own demand this is extremely important and this is this is where classicals failed us because in 1930 we come we came across a scenario where supply did not create its own demand and intuitively also even a layman person can tell you that no this isn't the co- isn't the case always anyways let me explain this statement a bit this statement was actually given by a swedish economist john baptista say and from his surname we got this term says law we can explain this term with the help of an example let's say there are people working in the market in the industry they are producing certain output certain goods certain consumer goods okay and they are paid for rendering their services whatever earning they are getting it's their income and they're going to use that income to buy goods and services so in a way the employment of labor is creating output and at the same time the labor is getting paid and that income is used to create a demand for the very same output they are creating okay i hope i hope you got the idea so the underlying idea is there is always a sub- always a demand for whatever good is produced in the economy okay now we are on to fourth assumption it says there is a perfect wage price flexibility so this assumption simply means that there is never a case when there going to be unemployment if unemployment is there wages going to change itself price is going to go flexible in such a way that if you going to get back to the original level of full employment for example let's say there are 100 people who are seeking work and labor or wage rate is 100 rupees per hour now we know that entrepreneurs always are seeking for a minimum cost thing they want to produce goods at minimum cost and when there is excess supply of labor the wage rate going to go down i mean of course it's like munal sir says so ana ek ana so bimar so ana ek bimar something like this there are many people 
who are seeking work and there is excess supply of labor wage rate gonna go down and entrepreneurs gonna re-employ those people and we gonna have we're gonna be seeing that unemployment gone and people back back into the employment cycle so this is how this full employment state is maintained in the classical system but we know that this is absolutely not the case we have certain statutory limits we have decently government brought the wage code and then we have minimum wage act we have state-wise minimum wages and we have something called efficiency wage that that people who are into work we ought to pay them more so as to keep them motivated right so this point that wages are perfectly flexible is absolutely not true but again national let's just not deviate too much from this assumption we're talking about the classical economics is just the basic foundation of economics and we're gonna come to its critique also so we're gonna keep these points for criticism now we are on to the last assumption and it says money acts only as a medium of exchange this uh, this statement is again self-explanatory that money only assist us to exchange goods and services for example i am buying apple from a from a market and paying salary rupees 100 now the seller gonna use that 100 rupee to buy something else let's say chocolates so in reality only apple were sold and chocolate was bought chocolate was bought and money acted only as a medium of exchange only as a v as a cover up money assisted us to carry out those transactions but we know that this is not the case what if the what if the shopkeeper who sold me apple didn't use that money for buying the chocolate rather he or she kept that money as an idle balance but what if he or she saved that money and deposited it into the bank to be used much later so the idea is classical economics ignores the thing that money can act as a store of value also here it was emphasized that there are instant transactions people are not saving money will come to this thing also that people do save money but that saving is converted into investment that will come much later but right now just memorize that money acts only as a medium of exchange there is no saving there is no store of value and that's it money is only a v so today's lecture was important for you to have a little bit of basic idea about how this macroeconomics got evolved into where we are right now also, I feel it is quite an interesting subject if only we don't jump into this subject mechanically like start the model, write down its assumption, explain them and that's it. No, we should be talking about the idea, the reasons also why the theory got criticized and how we got into the next step, right? Okay, so that's it for today guys. I hope you liked the video and if you did then do subscribe to this channel or like the video and you can share this video if you want that these are helping you in any way okay thank you so much once again goodbye